Thank you, Raivo. Uh, all our panelists have been uh, nicely in time. We had a very disciplined uh, panel. This leaves uh, us uh, plenty of space for discussion, questions, comments. And I see people listened and are very eager to start. So I just take uh, uh, the first one and then let's move forward. Do you have a microphone? Yeah, here you see uh, hands in the front row, so let's start from here. So it's, it's working, isn't it? Is it working? Yeah. So uh, thank you very much for, for, I would like to take the opportunity to respond to, to some of the uh, remarks that Thomas Goodman made, but also to Dietmar von der Pforten. And I'm not so sure whether I have um, questions to be answered because I think that would be a start for a much longer discourse, but I try to be brief. And I would like to make uh, address three points, one concerning methodology, one empirical political aspects of analysis, and uh, one normative substantive aspects. Now, concerning methodology, so I, I started with what I call the conceptual analysis, and I think we have a disagreement here. I roughly follow um, on analytic philosophy in the tradition of ordinary language approach. The uh, meaning of normative concepts is given by analysis of their practice. And when we look at the practice, we see that most normative concepts are embedded in broader normative frameworks. So I think J.L. Austin did it for a, a speech act theory of performative acts and institutional background assumptions. H.L.A. Hart did it for the concept of law. John Rawls did it for justice as the primary virtue of institutions. Huh? So the, the first question when you do conceptual analysis is you have to decide what's the institutional background. And I think we have a, um, uh, we have a disagreement here more on, uh, so to speak, on, on the methodolo general methodology of analysis. Uh, but that's only analytically conceptual. I think the main point of my, uh, of my approach is there is nothing like a pre-social or pre-conventional or pre-institutional uh, conception of the unity of society. That's the main point I, I try to make. Uh, the unity of society is constituted by institutional membership and it requires institutions. So it's against Rousseauistic and other voluntaristic uh, accounts. I think you wouldn't disagree with the latter point. Uh, concerning the empirical political, um, I think here we have a great disagreement because I, it might have escaped my awareness, but I don't think that political globalization has, uh, was as fast or has reached the degree that economic globalization has reached. And I also don't see that the development of international legal regimes uh, amounts very much to, to, democratic, uh, to a democratic basis. So that leaves me as a liberal theorist with some concern about the uh, empirical and institutional conditions of uh, maintaining democratic politi politics in, in a transnational system, especially because liberal democratic states are a minority. So in, in principle, I think uh, conceptual analysis is, is totally open to, to different institutional frameworks. Yeah? I mean, I might think of a cosmopolitan empire, yeah? but then I would not only have to, to, to globalize citizenship, but I also have to find a way how to organize democratic political uh, agency in, in, in such an empire. Uh, um, construction or institution. So um, I think the, the, with, the, uh, with respect to normative substantive points, um, I think we, we agree. I mean, there should be, uh, there should be um, the possibility to, to achieve citizenship by uh, immigration and naturalization. There should be a plurality of citizenship concepts or of statuses, uh, residency status, and so on. 
I think the, the real point of disagreement concerns uh, the uh, inclusion of uh, uh, so societies as uh, collective institutions. And um, I think that ethical individualism is not identical with, mo with an ontological uh, individualism of, of social phenomena, as also Dietmar von der Pforten uh, pointed out. If we want to include political agency and the possibility of politics, we have to talk about collectives. Yeah, because in, in politics is essentially a collective activity and nothing which can be reduced to individual rights. And that's why I think um, that we cannot, we cannot eliminate, so to speak, the, the dimension of societies as collective political entities or as pol collective political associations from the analysis. So I think this might, I hope this was not too much and I thank you very much and also the audience for the patience. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the uh, presentations. I have a, a question for, for Dietmar von der Forten and another for, for Thomas Gutmann. The, the question for uh, Dietmar uh, von der Forten is a question with which I struggle myself, so uh, I would like to, to see um, uh, how you deal with this. My, my, pro, uh, my question has to do with the coherence of, of, of the argument. Uh, um, can one uh, argue from a normative individualistic point of view and still take into account reasons that are not individualistic, uh, communitarian reasons, so to speak, uh, that have to do with the boundedness of, of communities? I, I really... Um, because you argue from that normative individualistic, but then in that, in, among the reasons you invoke uh, are reasons that have to do with uh, communitarian grounds. I really, uh, I see what you mean. I, uh, you want us, uh, you want us to to consider uh, the the bound the boundedness of, of, of individuals within the the normative individualistic uh, point of view. But uh, is that totally coherent? That's 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 the that's my question. Another, I've already discussed uh, 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 something with uh, with Thomas uh, outside. Um, but uh, I would uh, I would uh, argue with the point that nationality is um, no, not nationality. I would agree nationality as. Thomas uh, 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 defined it, of course, nationality, uh, namely ethnic nationality or nationality given by, only by birth, would be a categorical inequality. But, but I, I suppose we have to distinguish here nationality from, uh, from, uh, from citizenship. Citizenship, I believe, is not a form of categorical inequality. It would only be a categorical uh, if there wouldn't of there uh, if there wasn't a right to naturalization according to reasons that are not themselves arbitrary uh, for uh, one cannot deny naturalization on the grounds of sex religion etc you could say of course that citizenship uh, itself uh, is an arbitrary institution but uh, i don't believe citizenship uh, different from nationality, uh, is, uh, an, is arbitrary. There are some, there are strong reasons not to, to abandon citizenship as a, as a, as a criterion. Uh, and these are not just sociological or, or empirical. Uh, abandon citizenship as a relative, it is just relative criterion, namely for, for rights, would be to assume that those rights exist in an institutional and democratic uh, vacuum, and they, they do not. So 
uh, this is clear, I think, in the case of, of, of political rights. So if I, I don't, uh, 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 my question is, I would agree with you if you were referring to nationality defined in, as an exclusionary category, but I wouldn't agree if you were referring to citizenship as a possibly inclusionary uh, category. Thank you. Big questions indeed. When it comes to methodology, um, methodology is a tool. It follows function. And there are a lot of questions you can do with, with ordinary language philosophy and analytic philosophy. And I do so when I do, let's say, medical ethics or biomedical ethics. I stick to analytical philosophy. I don't need anything else. If we're talking about, about uh, meter trends in, in international politics and the development of our normative principles, um, this will not do the trick. And uh, it didn't do the trick for John Rawls, starting in the 80s. There is not, not so much ordinary language philosophy left in political liberalism and things like that. Other problems, other methods. Um, I don't think that um, you can have the easy way out to say society is just what we perceive of it in our everyday practices. Maybe you should, we could call that community or what else. But I think, and this is a methodological point was really important to me, we have this different disciplines specialized in, in looking at certain problems and certain perspectives. And sociology, in the way I used it, is a sociological term. And there's a lot of discussion going on about the, dis, the, the um, best and most adequate definition of what constitutes a society. And that's what I was drawing upon, that in our everyday Lebenswelt, as we say in Germany, or uh, life from practices, we conceive each other roughly in a very nebulous way as some sort of unity. We here in Germany, things like that, that we have these perceptions. Yes, of course we have. Is it of any importance? My point is it isn't. And you shouldn't call it society. Because in calling it society, you're playing on the field of sociology. And if you play there, play by their rules. Otherwise, invent, <laughs> otherwise invent, invent another, another term. I'm, personally, I, I see, I, I see the, the, the uh, importance, although I, I really try to play them down for political reasons, of, of culturally transformed identities and, and everyday lifeful practices and, and perceptions. It's okay. I mean, it's yeah. Uh, but um, so to speak, when we when we talk about uh, unity of society, is not only a sociological term. Communitarians, Republicans use it. The classical term is the unity of the people, uh, ex pluribus unum. Uh, uh, or in the 18th century, yes. it's body politic. Or in 17th yes. century, yes. and. I think we have to we have to distinguish uh, not so much disciplinary questions, but the question whether we are interested in a descriptive self-understanding or whether we are interested in a norm, in a normative assessment. Yeah? yeah, and I was talking about a normative assessment, and I was not saying that the formal institutional conception uh, is how people in society understand themselves. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, uh, yeah. I think that yeah. just uh, was... But, but unfortunately, yeah. that's not the last resort and not the last no. question, because we might misunderstand ourselves in a very, very fundamental way. And that was my point. When it comes to the to, to empirical dimension, yes, especially the law lacks behind, and even, even Nicholas Luhmann had real problems to conceive legal systems other than national systems. Yeah. Legal systems are, are still very little globalized. Uh, uh, that's right. 
But anything else? Really? Anything else? Any, any real social, not only economics, science? Well, well, that's, yeah, that's politics. That brings me to, to the second, uh, or to the third union, the substantive one. Do we need collectives? Yeah, of course we do collectives to do politics. But, but, but who says that uh, um, they must not radically change? Are, is, are they pre-given? Is this, this, the German collective is pre-given and there we do, this is a, the body politic. Why? I think we could, we could, no, so yes, we would. But, uh, uh, okay, and I think um, the, the weak point is, because I didn't pay much attention to this and I got this question to time. the weak point is, it wasn't, my point wasn't to, to, to give a solution, say I'm, I'm for institutional constitutionalism, which I am, but I didn't argue for that today. And institutional citizenship, a word I used, um, I'm for, for opening citizenship systems. Yeah? And maybe, maybe the better one is because, as uh, Louis made very clear, and I didn't want to contradict this, uh, for the time being, we will be in dire need of, of, of functioning institutions, functioning legal institutions, to get anything done. And we got these institutions almost exclusively in the nation side, so we can't do away with that. And that might mean that we, in the end, need what you called yesterday a diversification of citizenship regimes in, in our countries. Maybe this will, will do the trick. But uh, the collective of the demos, who constitutes the demos, that can radically change. I think it will radically change. It's still a collective, but a very different one. And I was talking about the regime, the in a Foucaultian sense, the structure of inclusion and exclusion into these systems. And they are not, they're inclusive for the happy few who are well-trained or rich, of course. For them, citizenship or migration was never a problem. For these, for these people, it is never uh, um, uh, a categorical uh, exclusion because being not a German is not burned into their skin as it is for 95% of the people worldwide these days. And uh, this brings me to, to the question of, of Louis. Yeah, as much as, as uh, our citizenship regimes become <coughs> more inclusive and more detached from, from the notion national, which is in Germany, as Dietmar showed, very, very strong, um, the more they lose their character of as categorical uh, exclusions. Of course, yes, diversification will do the trick. I'm happy with that. Okay. Yeah. Um, what concerns methodology, um, I think uh, original language analysis is valuable. I did it also a little bit with citizenship and, and uh, Staatsangehörigkeit and citizenship, but I don't agree that it is the ultimate methodology. I think uh, language is adapting to some concepts which are more fundamental and these concepts are still more fundamental based on common experiences of some sort of reality and this reality is with citizenship some sort of understanding ourselves in associations and this cannot be uh, abandoned so easily and if the individuals in this community want to preserve it, it also should not be abandoned so easily with functional reasons. This is my disagreement with, with Thomas Goodman. On empirical questions, I think that, um, yeah, they are political entities and if the citizens in these political entities want to keep to them. This is a reason to stick to, to them. There could not be a, a wise philosopher king uh, ruling the world and telling all the people now this uh, is dysfunctional and uh, from a theoretical point of view you should abandon this interest you have in your 
community. For example, the Estonian uh, community as a singing community, as I referred to it. And the normative um, question, yeah, I think individualism has two forks. It, 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 it justifies uh, human rights, uh, pre-community human rights, but it also, and this is the other fork, and I think this is a little bit not enough developed in, in Thomas Goodman's accounts. This is a disagreement we have. It also justifies some sort of communities if these individuals uh, want to keep to these communities. Uh, communities can be justified, all sort of communities, municipalities, families, but also nations, if these individuals want to keep them up. If we all decide to to transgress them, if the Estonians decide to unify with the Lithuanians or whatever, or the other Baltics, okay, that's no problem. But if they decide to not do this, uh, there, I see no no functional. This this is not a, a real reason. This functionality is, is is in my sense not individualistic, but is some sort of sociological. Uh, miracle or whatever, or a sociological uh, God coming down in this discipline. I don't think this has a really normative grounding. Uh, this is our, I think, disagreement, uh, Thomas, uh, we, we have. And, um, and uh, concerning Luis Pereira Coutinho, uh, I, I, even if you ground the arguments in individual concerns or interests. I, I stressed several times in my presentation, this is a last justification. It's no problem to, uh, to uh, ground with, on this individualistic ground, uh, secondary communal interests, communitarian interests, which, which, for example, the Estonian have the interests, yeah, to keep together as a sort of nation in a, in a, in a sense. And I, I think this is perfectly justified and this is a sort of weak communitarianism. The only thing I, I criticize or wouldn't hold as really justified is some sort of strong communitarianism which says communities have a last uh, intrinsic uh, justifying uh, ground as humans, individuals have. I don't think this is true and we see in the whole migration situation that the individuals want to change their communities they are living in. This is, a, I think migration is the most important and the most decisive and striking expression of this form of normative individualism because the individuals want to migrate from one community, leave the one and go to another. And this is in some sense a justified uh, wish or interest, it is not an absolute interest. There are also the interests of the receiving community and these are weak communitarian interests which are also justified. This is the problem, the clash and the discussion and we have to try to find some sort of, of solution and balancing without neglecting uh, one of these sides. Uh, okay, thank you. Now we move to the next row. Uh, 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 you both had uh, questions, yeah? I sympathize, I think, enormously with the normative reasons that are behind open borders. Still, I'm not persuaded. And I will try to explain why very briefly. The two of you. Uh, but the, the question is the following. First is that if you are in favor of open borders, you are over-focusing on subjective rights and not so much on collective goods. But the question is whether the subjective rights can be effectively protected without the collective goods. In the following sense, if you are for open borders, you assume that there is no need of distributing the right to freedom of movement. That it can be a question of individual demand, so to say. We were using for a second the economic language. It's a question of individuals exert the right when they want. But is it 
that there is no need of distribution of the rights. Can everybody exert the right to freedom of movement at the same time? And I don't think so. I don't think so because you need for some to move to most that most stay put. If not, it does not work. You want to go somewhere where there is a function in society. For the society to exist, you need that most of the people are not moving. If everybody is moving, there is no work in society, pushing it to the limit. So my pushing to the limit is not because this is a plausible scenario. It's only to show that you need the collective goods for the rights to be effective. But if this is so, there is something in the structure of the right to freedom of movement that requires a distributional pattern. And if there is a need of the distributional pattern, very obviously there are very good normative reasons that we don't want only the rich to move. We want another pattern of distribution because if not, this is something that cannot be defended. This is the problem, I think, with free movement in the European Union now. That is free movement essentially for the rich, for the high flyers, so to say, for us, if you wish, not for everybody. Workers have no Europe if you wish. It's not mine. Eh? It's a good, catchy title, but it's not mine. It's Cédric Durand. Second question is that I think there is some confusion in the open borders because, or it seems to me, perhaps it's not. It's only my uh, misunderstanding. But I think there is a certain element of confusion between the problem of the nation and the nation states, and I fully agree with that. I think this is a relic, if you wish, in many ways, as such as the kind of pre-political nation state, with the problem of territory, which is a different one, and is related to what I have just said. In order to have a functional society, you need a society that is territorially based. But if the society is territorially based, then you need some kind of reference to the territory. So I would only add to what uh, Christina was saying, that is not only a question of politics, it's also a question of the social state. You cannot have a social state without an element of endurance, so to say, of membership and this kind of stuff. The social state is also about the collective. It's a collective that can be exclusionary. Marine Le Pen does not want the same welfare state as I want. That's clear. It can be exclusionary, and it's turning exclusionary in Europe now. But that's a different question. And now, very briefly, uh, to rival. Um, not knowing about the details, but having always been puzzled by the original decision not to grant citizenship in a much wider way to the Russian minority, what you were telling us, does it not imply, if the political goal is to prevent a vulnerability of a potential, let's assume for, for the time being, not going into this discussion, imagining that there is a vulnerability because Russian, what you call Russian expansionism. But is this not then related to the mistake of not granting citizenship originally to everybody? Because would it not be Estonia less vulnerable in that case? Yeah, and let's take the next question also, then we have a row of answers. Thanks, because this is also related, and I think I'm also addressing uh, Thomas and Dietmar. Um, I'll start with a provocative uh, question to Thomas. Are we seeing a, an aggregation fallacy in, in, in your argument, in the sense that uh, is, is the real beef about citizenship or is it about sovereignty? I mean, is there an assumption of, of what form of sovereignty is actually assumed uh, behind your, your thinking about <laughs> citizenship? Because I think it matters whether we're talking about state sovereignty versus democratic sovereignty or people's uh, popular sovereignty. And and I, um, and, I also, and I want to, to develop that by saying that maybe we should also distinguish between uniform national citizenship and federal citizenship. I think, I think this, this aspect of, of federalism has been under, <laughs> underplayed in this type of discussion because one of the interesting things about federalism is on the one hand that it was a doc doctrine that was alternative to the state, to the, to the Bodinian idea of state sovereignty, which was a, a, a unified notion whereas federalism was about generating, in, in Luhmann's terms, an irritation into the very notion of communal uh, 
uh, allegiance because it was a dynamic interaction between communities. So that generates a, a much more nuanced and an ongoing reflexivity, actually, in terms of the understanding of community. And if you pitch then sovereignty at the popular level uh, and think that governments, in that sense, emanate from the people, you are, you are developing this uh, irritation into the system. So why not extend this and see that this is something that is not purely confined by, by uh, uh, the, the standard notion of state as being, I mean, in a barbarian sense. If, if you soften the idea of sovereignty, then you are getting into a different circumstance. So citizenship is not actually the big problem in this case. It is, it is one element that enables the democratic process to go on, to allow, allow people to, to, to control the, the institutions that they are, uh, in, that are subject to. But, it, but the broader structure is quite different in terms of this type of mediation going on. So I think that, that there is, this injects a certain element of reflexivity into this that, that provides an opening for many other dynamics to prevent um, the pathologies that you were referring to. So, so I think you can get further with, with citizenship by blending it with democracy in this type of uh, complex configuration. Uh, the, the second one is, is more directly to, to Dietmar about um, the distinction between normative uh, and collective uh, individualism, normative individualism versus uh, collective individualism. I think we are completely on, online. I mean, my, my total instinct is that we, we have to start from normative individualism. I mean, anything else is, is a non-starter, basically. It, it, it's rejecting the, the whole <laughs> uh, enlightenment and so on. So, I mean, the, the question is rather what status it should have and what type of distinction we are looking at. And I think that the distinction is overdrawn. Uh, I think that normative individualism must serve as a regulatory norm, as, as the in that sense, fundamental objective of designing constitutions and everything. However, I, I, said, I said normative individualism must serve as a regulatory norm and must be embedded as a key principle, of course, as we do see in, in modern constitutions. Now, what about the, the role of the collective in this sense? Well, I think much of the work here can be done by, by means of representation. But there is something missing in the way in which representation thinking about representation is thus far evolved in this because it's too much steeped in the principal agent notion and it's a fairly static notion. Whereas if you start, if you introduce a more modern and new notions of representation that's much more dynamic in terms of the interaction between um, leaders and people, then you can get a much more dynamic conception and therefore you can mediate between commu uh, the community and the individual in a much more uh, sensible way, so therefore actually that reduces the whole distinction, in, in, even in practice, I think, uh, than that. So I would make a plea for, for including more focus on representation in, in dealing with this. Okay, let's take uh, the answers. I hope our panelists are as concise as uh, they have been, but I also ask the following uh, people asking questions to be concise, because we have still many questions, and uh, uh, currently we have had uh, slightly long questions, uh, more resembling mini lectures. So uh, think how to focus in your question. Okay, I will start with um, the question of Augustine um, Jose Menendez. I agree with many things you, you said. I think um, you are right that uh, the individual rights are connected to um, existing communities and their they are goods and uh, it was, there's also some sort of question what are the means for the people who can move or should move. Uh, the only difference uh, I think uh, we have, or I wouldn't disagree, is this idea that rights are distributed. Uh, that I don't think is, is true, and uh, this is a fundamental difference also, as I think, with Rawls or some f other people. Um, I think uh, rights, fundamental non juridical moral rights are, are not the outcome of some sort of uh, distribution, collective distribution. Um, if, if you think otherwise, um, there is always a danger to um, abandon these rights and found them in some sort of collective emanation or collective good or patriotism or whatever. 
so this is uh, the disagreement. Um, yeah, uh, the question of John Eric uh, Fossum, I agree also with what you said. Uh, sovereignty, as I also said, it, that sovereignty is linked to citizenship and all these other concepts, but also collective realities, political realities. Citizenship cannot be uh, yes, just looked at uh, separately. It is connected with state, sovereignty, territory. This is true and it's also uh, so, so, so we have to talk about the reduction of sovereignty if we t talk about the reduction of, of the limitation of civil citizenship. And, and one main historical outcome of sovereignty was to to decide, the state decides sovereign uh, about uh, who is the citizen, inclusion, exclusion. Yeah, representation, I think also you are right that representation is a decisive, and also I, I put it on a slide, uh, factor to link the people or the individual citizens to the political decision. I'm not so optimistic about overcoming this um, yeah this necessary link or relation I think it is a sort of very fundamental uh, and this brings me back to Christine question very fundamental necessity or condition of political communities and political actions that there are individual human beings and these political communities and you cannot yes overcome it or everything which tries to dissolve this totally is will not succeed so so you need some sort of representation <coughs> which has also some sort of unequalness and non equalness because there is a elite which represents this is every represent is an elite even if 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 he or she is Totally, yes, socialist, leftist, he's an elite. Uh, he's, he's a commissar or where, wherever, he's an elite. And if you say this is not true, this is dangerous. This is dangerous. Uh, Carl Schmidt had this idea that, uh, that the leader is uh, the same as uh, the people who are, are led. And, and I find this dangerous. I find this idea of identity of elite and others, I find this dangerous. I don't I like this uh, because it is... Uh, anti-individualistic and anti-realistic and also anti-democratic. Uh, it, it comes in a way to identity between leader and, and, and this. So, so you need representation. This is a very fundamental element of our, uh, yes, political world. And it's better to understand it, to reflect it, to argue with it, to, to sustain it with good arguments and good procedures, this is, I think, the better way. Okay. Do you want to add, Thomas? Okay. Augustine, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just turning the question around. Yesterday you started with, with a slightly modernized version of, of Karl Marx's critique of individual rights from his text on the Jewish question, 1842 talking about liberty and equality in a materially, substantively unequal society is a lie, it's ideology, yeah? In reality, we're not equal, we're just unequal in power, in wealth, in life chances, and that's it, point. Um, I'm very sympathetic to that idea because I myself come from this tradition. Problem is, um, it's too simple. And I think any left-wing concept of any society you would like to live in has to come to grips with the concept of individual rights. I think this, not only as Luhmann said, quoting once more, the most important idea modern legal systems devised, I think it's the best idea our extraordinarily stupid species ever had. And moreover, I think that it's the only idea which is still able to organize collective action. There is no other historical subject left. I don't like it, but that's the case. So, and there is, from a normative point of view, there is no concept of the collective good which could be thought completely apart 
of individual rights. They are not the same, of course. So I think the only one to realize the collective good of a, or to save even the collective good of a welfare state is by strengthening individual rights in the end, which does not mean in any case to take on any neoliberal agenda, especially not the one the EU took in. Yeah. So I think it would, well, I think progressive politics has a long tradition in shooting into its own knees, and it would be one instance of, of I think, stupidity to play, to play individual rights too hard against the collective good. That won't work. Um, you know, Eric Fosse, I was talking about the, about the categorical, in most cases, categorical effects of exclusion of our systems of belonging. I played it along the, the notion of citizenship. It depends on how you define it. I could have played it along the notion of sovereignty, of course. Um, and the result is the same. If you diversify citizenship, as uh, Christina Kvashka talked about yesterday, or if you, as you put it, soften the idea of sovereignty, you will come to very similar results. Yeah? This means that this exclusion, insofar you do it, this form of exclusion uh, loses its categorical property. And this, for me, would be a good thing. On the other hand, when it comes to the nation state, nation state well, let's face it, there, is not, there are not so many things left for sovereignty on the national level these days? Is it really so important? I think to keep company and to keep functioning political bodies in the end, empirically, I think the level will not, will not be the nation state, the level will be the city. Yeah? As Benjamin Barber wrote, I think he's right in that. And the global level. The national level will, will not be the way we still make decisions will really affect our lives. Yeah? With one exception, which which will lag behind and have no complete solution for it, it's the legal systems. For the time being, the legal system is the one who is most intensely constructed on the national level, and I don't want to give it up. I'm a lawyer. Yeah? Primarily, I feel, I feel a part of the German legal system. I don't feel as... I would give up the role of being a German citizen or being part of the German culture, but I'm part of the German legal system. Um, yeah, on the, this notion, do you think the, yeah. You me, so that's it. No, I Okay, uh, let's, let's continue. You. Sorry, your time is This is raising picking. Yeah, uh, Raivo, please. I don't come with you. <laughs> yeah, why? Not everybody was granted uh, citizenship uh, after Estonia regained independence. So short answer is that uh, granting citizenship uh, is a political question. And uh, there was a certain political process in which there were two key moments. Because actually for a very long period, the key political organization, which was Popular Front, its position was that uh, citizenship should be granted to uh, everybody. But there were two key events. One event was independence referendum, which was carried out half a year before Estonia regained, regained independence in August 1991. The referendum was in March 19, 1991. According to the referendum results, about 100% of ethnic Estonians supported independence of Estonia, and among non-Estonians, Estonian Russians, the, the percentage was about 25. So society was polarized. Next key event, political event, was coup d'etat in Moscow in August uh, 1991. This was perceived that you know this securitized again the the whole field. And in this process, the other key political institutions, the institution in Estonia, which was a citizenship committee, and which, which uh, supported this uh, idea of legal continuity, they managed just to take away. It was a result of political struggle. Two players, 
one player manage to take uh, uh, to take over to convince whole uh, uh, to, to, to convince a majority of ethnic uh, uh, Estonians that we should go uh, this uh, way. If I take, for example, my own example, for me it was natural that everybody living in Estonia will 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 become a citizen of Estonia in independent uh, Estonia. But after these two key events, I also started uh, uh, to doubt, and 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 majority of Estonians started uh, to doubt. So it is just uh, simply political dynamics, political process in which uh, radical nationalistic wing managed to take over and to impose its uh, its policies. Uh, thank you. Now we move to the third row. Uh, um, yeah, and uh, please be concise. Oh my God. Thank you. I try to be very short because uh, some questions have already, be, al uh, already been asked that I wanted to ask here. Uh, for the two first speakers, uh, uh, for Thomas Goodman, I think I agree with a great part of what you have said of, of your position. Uh, I won't explain why it will do it. I mean, it's evident indeed, but uh, not with the conclusion, open borders, so open borders, uh, because I don't know what it means, uh, open borders, that the right to cross the borders is the right to uh, to have a work uh, in the new country, the high right to to get uh, social protection, so on. So that my, my question is, what does it mean, open borders? So, uh, and uh, to... With, in relation with this remark, uh, I think we have, we should distinguish as for all of our discussion between different level of argumentation, more precisely than we do that. I mean, uh, uh, to distinguish between normativity and empirical considerations, uh, we all do that. But there are also different levels of normativity. My uh, so my speech, speech bar on a high level of normativity, I think I agree with the uh, individualistic uh, position. Uh, but uh, uh, when you go further in details, or uh, then, or in the practical problems, then you have to tackle with uh, other kinds of normative problems. And uh, that it's the part of our dissent. No, not all of them, but part of our dissents are coming from the fact that we don't differ differentiate it enough between these different levels of normative questions. So, remark, and uh, second remark, more to citizenship, okay, citizenship. I still uh, stick to the, this, to the interpretation from, uh, of Etienne Balibar of the uh, French Revolution, that in the fr moment of the French Revolution, there was no identification between citizenship and national citizenship. Citizenship is a concept of the uh, declaration of right. Nationality is a concept of the constitution that is of organization of the uh, collective life. And I think it's quite important to still uh, to, 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 to make this distinction, so when we ask whether citizenship is obsolete or not, national citizenship partly doesn't mean that it doesn't exist anymore, but we can say, we can argue that in the actual structure of the world, the national citizenship maybe could be obsolete. I leave it to, to the discussion. Uh, citizenship uh, are the right to political activity. It's a very bright conception. If we leave aside, if we would say citizenship in this sense is obsolete, I don't know what democracy means, as in the modern sense of the word. That's only my, my remark, short remark. Okay, now please raise your hand who still have questions. Let's move on to here. Yeah, one question to Thomas Gutmann. Um, again, about the categorical uh, inequality of citizenship. Um, and I'm, I have still troubles uh, whether this is really um, a good example for this kind of inequality. Um, because, I mean, there's, there's one inequality uh, with regard to citizenship and statelessness. Either I uh, am a citizen or I have no citizenship at all. So that's one kind of inequality. 
but you referred to an inequality which is somehow inherent in, in citizenship. But um, if, if I keep away uh, statelessness, I mean, I always have uh, citizenship, there. Um, and it means to have citizenship that citizenships are mutually exclusive. So if I am citizen of state or nation A, I'm not a citizen of all the other, some exceptions uh, excluded, and the other way uh, uh, around. So I'm not sure whether this is really a case of categorical inequality. The inequality comes, uh, as Dietmar uh, has pointed out and, and several others, uh, the inequality comes with the, with the socioeconomic inequality uh, uh, which lies below the citizenship. So what, what value does citizenship have uh, for a citizen uh, of uh, nation A and a citizen of nation B? There are the inequalities. Um, and and uh, these are in, but these are inequalities of graduation and not of category. And I mean to overcome the exclusionary effects of different uh, types of citizenship it would be to um, to overcome uh, uh, social and economic inequality among different uh, states. And I think it's not so much a question of open borders. If there would be no, uh, if there were no inequality, uh, perhaps we don't need any <laughs> kind of citizenship anymore. But I could also imagine that, that your suggestion of a, of a global citizenship could be compatible with uh, a massive socioeconomic inequality. So that it, even if we had global citizenship, for someone from Somalia, it uh, might have less value than for someone in, in the United States uh, or somewhere else in a wealthier part of the world. Uh, thank you. Please raise your hands uh, once more. Now I have to discriminate because our time is running short and uh, we don't uh, have a universal human right to questions. But uh, please hold your hands so I select two more and then we uh, stop. So maybe you get the chance and you get the chance. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question uh, can be addressed to all panelists, but specifically I want to address to Professor Vitul de Venden. Um, when you talk about um, statelessness, uh, you mention uh, an examples, um, basically uh, people that were uh, expelled by their own countries uh, and uh, basically meaning that they are uh, were de detracted from their citizenship, not willfully. But my question is, uh, what do you think about um, specific type of statelessness that, for example, exists in uh, Estonia and Latvia, that uh, this type of statelessness was um, institutionally, to some extent, adapted, and uh, some people um, even were bo born uh, from parents of these people to be already stateless, uh, stateless. So what do you think about this specific type that uh, people that were already kind of uh, not having these rights that, uh, uh, that were already exist with the citizenship? Thank you. And the last question. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Professor Vettig. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, it's a very personally interesting uh, uh, discussion. And I would like to ask that now that I've been uh, living for approximately two years in Estonia from Finland, I've been looking at a very different kind of national pride in Estonia than how it's expressed in Finland. And uh, therefore, I'd like to ask you how reliable you take these questions you were basing this uh, data, that as questions are always subjectively interpreted, that compared to, for example, Finnish flag, 
or Estonian flag that does a flag, for example, invoke national pride as a symbol, as it seems a lot of the national symbolism has been captured by populistic factions nowadays. So what is your basis for choosing these questions? Thank you, and now uh, let's have uh, brief answers, and uh, let's start from this side uh, for a change. Uh, so please, Raivo. Yeah, the idea of uh, these uh, questions was uh, to figure out uh, about uh, national identification of both uh, Estonians and uh, Estonian Russians. And, 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 and the idea of asymmetry is a basis which means that we, we need to ask different questions from, uh, uh, from these two uh, uh, different uh, pools. And in respect of uh, Estonian and Russians, uh, we ask the question, I, I feel pride when I see the Estonian flag, Estonian state uh, protects my rights, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, et cetera. And the reason why we did ask this kind of question it was that we saw that this is a kind of challenge for Estonian and Russian in the, in the context of, for example, citizenship policy, when they were excluded citizenship uh, in the beginning of 1990s. So in this context, to, to agree that, uh, uh, that I, I feel pride seeing Estonian flag, et cetera, et cetera, it means a kind of, you know, you need to kind to overcome a certain uh, challenge. And on the other hand, also in respect of ethnic Estonians, the question, uh, the question, uh, uh, what was asked, that you know we need to take into account the view also of uh, minority, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in the uh, in the political context of Estonia, uh, this is a kind of overcoming of uh, challenge because. Uh, because there is a narrative that, you know, Estonia was occupied, Russians are occupiers, etc., etc., and in this context, you know, you need to overcome this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of prejudice. So the idea behind uh, this type of questions is, is, is different as, as compared to mainstream public uh, uh, opinion, uh, opinion service. It is based on the idea of asymmetry, of interesting field, both sections are on asymmetric positions, and, and and the idea was that you know we need to ask questions which which indicate how they overcome certain challenges which is posed to them in in the in the in the context Estonia is uh, uh, located. So it is a different kind of a cro uh, approach as compared to mainstream public opinion service which ask just questions, how do we feel about that or, uh, or another thing. This, uh, our, our theoretical reasoning behind that is that you know, we need to go deeper, we need to pose certain challenges to learn about uh, uh, national identity either of Estonians or Estonian Russians and as far as these challenges are different for Two groups. We, we need to ask uh, different questions. Thank you for the, the question. So, in order to have a broad uh, uh, answer, I, I could say that uh, we have to uh, hear at the uh, convention of the United Nations uh, on the statelessness of 1954, and we ha we have to try to reduce the cases of statelessness. Uh, even if they are uh, very different and, and, and inserted in, in very uh, uh, historical uh, uh, reasons. Uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, if we want to go to more uh, rights to uh, citizens, uh, we have uh, to uh, try to reduce that and to also respect the Article 15 of the uh, Declaration of, uh, of Human Rights of 1948. So this is the first point. Uh, I, I think that uh, 
uh, we have to also uh, th this problem can be solved just with uh, uh, with the coordination uh, of the states which are involved uh, in this question. So without any co coordination and agreement of states which are included in the question of uh, statelessness, we will not uh, uh, succeed to have a real uh, uh, answer. The, the, the third point is that uh, uh, we, we have to to see uh, uh, how uh, states uh, which are built on the rise of the of the birth uh, try uh, to include uh, those who are there, uh, and uh, I think that for Baltic states. Uh, from my point of view, uh, uh, perhaps at the second and third generation, it will not be uh, uh, possible to have uh, two categories between uh, ethnic uh, Estonians and Russian uh, 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 Estonians, uh, because for the children who were born there, uh, they don't uh, uh, really uh, uh, share the, the, the conflicts, uh, the historical conflicts, uh, uh, which are at the origin uh, of these two uh, statuses. Uh, and if the, the state uh, uh, wants to be more inclusive and guarantee more rights of citizenship to all of the population, here, the, the right of the territory uh, is equal as the right uh, of uh, 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 cultural identity. Why not? Those who were there for a long time uh, perhaps uh, have the same right of, to be citizens as those uh, who claim that uh, uh, Estonian uh, identity is their uh, cultural background. So why not? Uh, and so uh, I think that uh, uh, for the, the, the children uh, of the uh, of this uh, both uh, situation, uh, we we have to, to reflect about a unique uh, status for this population. Thank you. And now, um, uh, Dietmar and Thomas, uh, obviously you, you can't answer it all, but I still give you, let's say, two minutes uh, maximum to okay. just One summarize. Minute. I agree that there are different levels of normativity, and on every level it gets more concrete and richer, and you need additional arguments. That's, that's clear. And so on every level, I try to develop from normative individualism, you need additional arguments to go further. This is clear. And the second point, um, yeah, political activity is another dimension of it, and it seems to be uh, that it's divided from traditional citizenship as membership to states, as you see also in the European Union, voting rights for, uh, yes, residents of other European countries, in communal voting rights. So this gets apart, but we have to look where are the steps to tore it apart. And I agree with, with Klaus Günther that um, it is not a fundamental question of equality if everybody has at least one citizenship which gets gives him or her formal equality traveling around in the world and so on and the, the question of economic equality is an additional we have to solve by economic redistribution or means globally thank you and thomas maximum two minutes what Wallace just means that, well, I made a point about the starting point of the discussion, not about the result. So, so open borders means that the default position is that everybody who comes here is A, allowed to cross the border, and B, to stay here, to participate in everything the legal system has to provide, from being protected by basic rights to participating in the welfare state. This is this is the default position. And then we have to argue, are there really, really strong reasons to say that this is not feasible? I don't think that is the case, but this would have to be discussed. But if you would say, for example, that you have to keep all those Africans out because you have to protect and rebuild the welfare state who has been so damaged by the European Union, yeah? Uh, in order for your own people, looking that you have 30 or 40 or 50 percent of unemployed youth in Spain or, or Italy, well, 
you have to be careful because you might find yourself in bed with Marine Le Pen quite easily. So <laughs> that's a fact. I think, Klaus, the, the argument, I didn't want to belittle gradual inequality. Not at all. This, this might be the real problem after all. We're on the same page here. But nevertheless, categorically, inequality is special. If you just transpose your argument saying citizenship, sovereignty, nationality is not a critic, uh, um, categorical inequality or categorical discrimination to other categorical discriminations. You said, hey, don't, uh, don't complain. You have a nationality. Burundi, for example, or Congo, or Burma, if you're a Rohingya. I don't deny you have a nationality. So I discriminate against women and I said, well, don't complain. I, I, don't, I don't deny that you have a sex or a gender. I don't say you're a sexless person. You're a woman. And that's the reason I, I discriminate against you. Yeah? If, if I say it's just, it's just about relative income, then I discriminate about, against the German women and say, let, let's say, let's say, say only, only 20% of, of German and Estonian women are allowed to the, to the labor market. The other 80% have to stay home and get their kids. So why do you complain about in the international level, you're still extremely privileged. You're on the upper 5% still, so why don't you complain, just shut up. The, the criticism of categorical inequality works another way. And when we have a solution to this, the next point will be social inequality in all its, okay, it's okay. I'm okay. not that sort of liberal who says, everything is okay if everybody has the formal, formal equal right. But I really think it, it makes a difference, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, it has been a really lively panel, uh, very uh, good and uh, I think provocative presentations because we had so many questions. These who uh, didn't have the chance to ask uh, the questions, use uh, the uh, break now. Uh, people are around and just uh, come and ask you a question. There are no gods, no monsters, just come and approach them and <laughs> ask your question. Okay. But uh, once more, thank you, panelists. Thank you, Thomas, Dietmar, Catherine, and Taiwan. And thank you, all participants.